Hi, everyone. Um, maybe y'all can see me. But my name is Tomi Anabandro, and I work at Macmillan Publishers. And today, I'm excited to introduce our author, Kalia Yang. Kalia Lang Yang is an award-winning Hmong American writer. She's the author of the memoirs, The Late Homecomer, a Fong family memoir, The Song Poet, and Somewhere in the Unknown World. Yang is also the author of the children's books, A Map into the World, The Shared Room, and The Most Beautiful Thing. Today, Cleo will be speaking about her newest work, Somewhere in the Unknown World, a collective refugee memoir. Described as an essential book of poetic beauty and social witness, Somewhere in the Unknown World is a collection of stories about refugees who have found new lives in Minnesota's Twin Cities. Although Minnesota is not known for its diversity, the state has welcomed more refugees per capita than any other from Syria to Bosnia, Thailand to Liberia. Now, with nativism on the rise, Kalia, herself a Hmong refugee, has gathered stories of the stateless, who today call the Twin Cities home, and in the process, restores history and humanity to America's strangers and redeems long tradition of welcome. So I'm happy to introduce Kalia, who will speak more about her book, and turn over the microphone to her. Thank you, Tommy, and hello, everybody. I'm Kalia, and I'm coming to you from St. Paul, Minnesota. I want to say to Marcelo and Jason, thank you for sharing your stories with us. I find them incredibly moving. So in order to understand somewhere in the unknown world, I think it's important to understand my journey into writing. I was born a stateless child in Thailand's Ban Binai refugee camp, part of the remnants from America's secret war in Laos. I was born in a place surrounded by men with guns and barbed wire fences. I belong to a man and a woman who walked the world without shoes. I remember being born in this place, asking my father if there was a bigger world, a world out there. My dad in his infinite beauty, he's a, he's a song poet in the Hmong tradition. He used to take me to the tops of the trees and my father would point to the distant horizons and he would tell me, look at the size of your hand. Look at the size of your feet. One day, my daughter will walk on the horizons her father has never seen. My father said to me that I was not a child of poverty or war or despair, but that I was hope being born, the captain to a more beautiful future. I had no idea what he meant. I lived in a world where girls like me were sometimes sold for bottles of fish sauce, but I believed in the strength of his shoulders long before I knew a bike, or a car or a plane, I saw the world from my father's shoulders. Every time there was talk of home and there was so much because suicide was the number one cause of death in this place where I was born. There would be these horrendous cries. Why are you dying here in this place that does not want you? Get up, get up so we can go home. I would ask the adults around me. I'd say, grandma, where's home? My grandma would tell me a story of the high mountains of Laos, a place surrounded by mist long before the bombs fell. My mom and dad imagined a future in America where one day I might become an educated person. When my family came to America, like so many other families, new immigrants and refugees, they had dreams for their children. They wanted doctors and lawyers. Lawyers protected the rights that we've never had enough of. Doctors healed what was broken in our bodies. My older sister won the North End Elementary School Spelling Bee in the third grade. A year and a half after my family came to America, she learned how to break apart the units of the language and piece them together again. So we decided that she was the one who was gonna be our lawyer, which meant then that by default, I would become our doctor. I'm the descendant of three shamans. It is not a choice a person makes, it is a calling. A calling to heal not only what is broken in the human body, but to correct what is ailing the human heart. And so I thought that was just fine. So that's what I did. But in college, my grandmother, and I will not say she's illiterate. She did not know how to read or write, but she read the wind and the rain, the earth, its plants. She read the human body well. My grandma, who had never been to school, 
who all of her name signed her name with a shaky X that stood in for Shuali. She said that she would walk out of that car when I graduated. They dropped me off on numerous occasions at Carleton College, only 40 minutes away from home for my family, it could have been the world. And my grandma said upon my graduation, she would leave that car behind and we would finally walk around that bald spot that I was growing to love. I was a senior, I was close to graduation when my grandma took a fall. I went to her and I told her to get up. Because in Bon Vinay refugee camp surrounded by death, I had made her promise me that she would never die. So I went to her and I said, Grandma, get up. She looked at me and she said, I'm not getting up. She said, there were people who loved me before you. Before you, I had a mom and a dad, brothers and sisters, your grandpa, my most precious baby girl. When you look at the map of a bigger world, there is no Hmong land to be found, but I'm gonna climb this mountain in my heart, Hmong mountain. I'm gonna swing open the door to the house of my youth. Dinner will be ready. Everybody will be there. And they will say, why are you so late in coming home? I could not cry for her to stay, but I cried for her leaving. When my grandma died, my aunts and my mother went through her 13 suitcases because none of her children had a house big enough so my grandma could have a room of her own. When they got to the 13th suitcase, they found letters. They swept them up into a corner. And I recognized those letters for what they were. All of the years when grandma lived in California and when we lived in Minnesota, long before cell phones and family plans, my older sister and I had written grandma all these letters to tell her that the people in Minnesota don't know that we have a grandma. But we do, we know that we have her. To ask her what she was doing with her days now, to tell her what we were doing with ours, each and every single letter said, I love you and I'm thinking of you. When I saw those letters, I went to them and I picked up a postcard that I sent her on a study abroad back to Thailand to show her a Thai actor who one day I was going to marry. And I turned the car over and I saw that my grandma had had read the card so many times with her hands that the ink had run off. That all I could feel were the indentations I made under the page. My grandma's biggest fear was that she would be forgotten. So my first book began as a project to remember her, to let the world remember her along with me. This old woman who would walk through a secret war, who'd come to America to till the fields in Central California and then to die here in Minnesota, in a house she hated, made of concrete and metal, steel. She dreamt often of the houses of her youth where the wind and the rain would visit inside the house. I wrote a book, I thought about my grandmother, but in the process I realized I was documenting the history of the Hmong in America, my own history. And that perhaps more incredibly still that I was using memoir to correct history because there are no history books across the, straight, the stretch of this land where there's Hmong mentioned in it. We are remnants of America's secret war. We should have died when those bombs fell. Laos, the most heavily bombed nation in the history of the world. A ton of bomb per citizen. So that is my journey into being a writer. I was learning how to carry the stories of the people I loved and I began sharing it with the world and in the beginning, the world did not know if I had written a novel or if it was in fact true. But that was 10 years ago. It is now 2020. I am now working on my ninth book coming out this year in both children and adults work. But this one, Somewhere in the Unknown World, I think is the cleanest document of who I am as a writer and where I am positioned right here, right now. I began this book in 2016. Donald J. Trump had just been elected president. I began this book with all of the fears inside of me, but more importantly than the fears, I began it from a foundation of faith. Faith that the stories of the superheroes in our lives are stronger than the ones on the silver screen. Faith that with these individuals by my side, we would journey through the next four years and that we would still journey forth into a better, not just America, but a better world. The book is an oxymoron, a collective refugee memoir 
Men were traditionally the realm of the wealthier, the more educated, those who had some fame, whose lives were interesting to many. It's a collective refugee memoir because I believe that the cry for peace is a collective cry. Because we live in a world that is creating more and more refugees all the time. I want to end by doing a reading from Somewhere in the Unknown World, from the text itself, from the very first story where everything began. And then we'll open up for that, for that singular question. The dedication. For the refugees from everywhere, men, women, and children whose fates have been held by the interests of nations, whose rights have been contested and denied, whose thirst and hunger go unheeded and unseen. So this is the original, original story, the first story that began this whole collection. It's called Sisters on the Other Side of the River. And I, will, um, I wrote it because the man who shared the story wanted me to write it. He said he was old and he was dying and everybody believed that he was a good man to have come forth from a war, but that wars don't produce easy good men. And so, and so I wrote it. I'm just gonna jump in and jump out because I believe that good writing is not only about imparting information, but about opening up human experience so that we can inhabit for a moment in time, each other's realities. 1979, the border between Laos and Thailand. There was a full moon the night of our crossing. All along the river, families were preparing to enter the water. I had seen two little girls going from family to family. In the moonlight, I could see the people shaking their heads at the girls. I prayed they would not come to us. The older one was six or seven years old. Her scraggly hair fell about her face. She carried the little girl on her back with a length of cloth. The child is three or four, but too weak to walk. In the older girl's arms, she carried a small pot. The little one whimpered occasionally, raising her head weakly, turning it from one side to the other, seeking comfort. Her sister was quiet as she walked along the line of families. It was impossible to ignore them. I had just blown up the raft and was tying my children together when the girl walked toward us. In the light of the moon reflected off the river, I saw her eyes big and round in her sunken face. She offered what was in her pot to me before her words came out. She said, this is all I have left in the world, this little bit of rice and the little sister on my back. Our mother and father, our aunts and uncles and grandparents were killed in the jungle. We are alone. We've traveled for the last five days on our own to get here. I said, I can't help you, I'm sorry. She persisted. I will give you this rice if you carry my baby sister with your family to the other side. I know it is not much rice, but it is all I have left. I said again, this time with more roughness in my voice because my children could hear her. I'm sorry, but there's no room on the raft. The girl's thin arms shook with the proffered rice in the near empty pot. Her, her little sister turned her head at the roughness of my voice to look at me. Those eyes. Those eyes too were large and dark like a little monkey's. They glistened at me, wet with tears. The older girl fell to her knees. It looked as if her thin arms had given out from under her. Her head was bowed and she begged, please uncle, you don't have to take me. I'm willing to die here on this side of the river. I would die happy knowing my sister is safe. Please, uncle. I shook my head at her, my own words now wet and sticky in my throat. The girl turned to my wife, who had her baby girl strapped to her front and said, please, auntie, please. She started to cry. We were the last family at the river's edge. Her cries turned into sobs. My wife's arms tightened around our little baby's body. I stood in front of the girl on her knees and my shaking wife. I said, little girl, we have to go into the river now. The soldiers are surely coming. You take your sister and you go hide in the jungle. When other families come, you ask them. Someone will help you. We can't. Her shoulders shook with her cries. She had no more words for us. The rice in the pot was in danger of spilling. I took hold of it with my hands. I put it down beside her. I said to my boys and my wife, hurry up. 
I turned from the girls and I pushed the raft into the river. I picked up my boys one by one and dropped them onto the raft. I helped my wife and our baby daughter strapped to her front onto the raft. The flimsy thing nearly toppled. I could hear the other men hurrying their families into the current. A voice called out, the soldiers are coming. I felt a tug on my shirt. I had hoped the girl would have walked away, taken my words to heart, found a place to hide. I had hoped hopelessly. She stepped into the river after me. I did not have the heart to pry those fingers loose. So I said, I'll come back for you both, I promise. As soon as I get my children and my wife to the other side, I would turn back for you, just wait here. Her fingers fell from my shirt. My wife echoed my words to the girls, my children too. I turned to the girls one last time and placed my hands on their heads, a sign of love. I looked into their eyes and I believed in myself. I would come back for them. The water was cold against my legs. The cold climbed higher as I walked farther into the river. My feet lost touch with the, rubber, with the river's bottom. I treaded water. I kicked water. Somewhere at the halfway point of the crossing, floating in the Mekong River, I clung to the raft and looked back at the girls. I could see they were still standing in the river, both staring straight ahead toward me. Their small pot of rice sat on the bank. Every few minutes, I looked back at them until they disappeared from view, until they were nothing more than lines of shadows in the moonlit night. And then this is um, from the very, very end of the selection. You're doing well for yourself and your family. You are a good man. That is what people say. They don't know the truth. They don't know that nearly 40 years ago on the banks of the Mekong River, on my way to freedom, I condemned two sisters to war. They don't know that I cannot forget those two girls, their eyes that night round like the moon in the high sky, looking at me, the lie I told, the lie I carry. They don't know that one day soon when my time comes, I will look into those eyes again and see the knowledge that I was not the man the sisters have been waiting for, that I could not be him. I pray and I hope that in another life beneath a different moon, I will be the man to turn that raft around. Only. That is just one of the stories from somewhere in the unknown world. In here, we travel with Myra in Bosnia. Myra, who grew up in a hotel, in a, an apartment without lights for six years. Myra, who one day ended up at McAllister College, because that is a reality. The impossible happens in the life of the refugee every day. Myra, who here is Richard Holbrook, the man who drafted the peace treaty that ended the Bosnian War speaking. Myra who found herself in Kofi Annan's room at McAllister College, who would begin doing the work of undoing wars inside the hearts of little girls around the world. This is a collection that represents for me my journey, not only as a writer, but as a human being, as a woman, as a 40-year-old woman who has learned not only to carry her own story, but those those around her, those that make her own possible. Thank you for your time. I believe that um, now we have an opportunity for a question. Yes, yes, we do. Kalia, thank you so much for sharing, um, as you said, both your story and the stories of those around you. Um, definitely one of the most profound, I think we've heard here at FYE. Um, I wondered if it would be possible for you to share some organizations for those of us who would like to do more to help new immigrants to our country. That is, that is a wonderful question. You know, Minnesota is an interesting place. It's a very cold place. Um, not quite what you would think of when you think about refugees from the, you know, the hot deserts of Africa or the humid jungles of, of Southeast Asia. But Minnesota has more refugees per capita than any other in the nation. And that is because of Lutheran social services and Catholic charities. They are two of the primary um, stakeholders in this, in this country's um, structure of refugee resettlement. And so here, because there's so many Lutheran churches, they were the first sponsors of refugees to the state. I think when we talk about refugees and there are refugees everywhere across this country, 
in all of our institute, institutions. Um, I think we have to talk about the work that needs to be done locally. And there I would suggest contacting your local refugee resettlement agencies. Refugees don't come here with very much. In fact, all refugees come here with debt. They're one-way flights out of their home countries. Um, but they come here needing clothes, needing sofas. I interviewed a lot of refugee resettlement um, workers for this book, and all of them agree that the hardest thing to say to a new refugee is that we are resettling you into poverty. And so the reality is that many of our refugees lived in harsh conditions, conditions that are sometimes harsher than the ones they knew back home before the things fell apart. My father has this line, he says, you know, whenever I ask him about his experiences as a refugee, he said, I never thought that the sky I looked under could fall on me, that the earth that I walk on can throw me off. And I think that is such a critical reminder here in America, that it is possible for any of us to become refugees. And I think maybe the most helpful thing is to understand our own stories in alignment with all of these refugee stories around us. We live in a world, again, that is creating more and more refugees all the time. In Hmong, we have a saying, the house may be small, but the heart is big. And I think if you travel with the bigness of your heart into your local communities and start looking, there will be many places where you can help. But my grandma always said to me in her work as a healer and a shaman, a medicine woman, every time you have the opportunity to help somebody, know that you have the power to hurt them. And so I will end there. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a, an honor. Leah, thank you so much for joining us.